Hello and welcome to our next lecture on seawater. So this is another one of those lectures that we're going to be breaking down into two parts. So today is going to be seawater part one and then for the next lecture we're going to do seawater part two. So let's go ahead and get started with seawater part one. All right so when we're talking about seawater yes we are talking about H2O but this is H2O with other things in it. So you should hopefully know that you guys can't drink seawater because it's got salt in it and salt is very dehydrating. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today is how these different organisms can deal with these salinities. And again, salinity is just dissolved salt. So let's go ahead and get into that right now. All right, so again, let's talk about seawater. So H2O, right? This is basic chemistry. Hopefully you guys remember basic chemistry, but if you don't, that's what we're going to talk about right now. So when we're talking about chemistry, we're talking about the study of matter. So matter is anything that takes up space and has a little weight, okay, or what's called mass. You can kind of think of it as the same thing. It's not exactly the same thing, but I'm going to leave that to your chemistry teachers to explain the difference. All right, so matter basically makes up everything. Everything is made out of matter. This TV monitor is made out of matter. I am made out of matter. The air is made out of matter, and so is water, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today is the water and that form of matter. Now, we do have elements in chemistry, elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, right? So these are, these are kind of like the basic building blocks of chemistry. So when we talk about elements, we're really talking about things that can't really be broken down into other things. Now, yes, they can because there's protons and neutrons and electrons, but really, you know, you have a molecule of oxygen, that's all you have. You can't break up that molecule of oxygen and turn it into, say, nitrogen. That's just not how it works. They're two very different elements, okay? This is a periodic table. Hopefully you guys at least know what that looks like. No, I'm not going to make you memorize them because, again, this isn't chemistry class. So you're off the hook there. Uh, but you, you should know some common elements, again, like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. These are all really important to us because that's what makes us us is this, all, is all these different elements, um, especially things like oxygen and carbon. I mean, it's like the bulk of us. All right, so when we're talking about adding a couple of these atoms together. So remember, we have an atom of oxygen or a single, you know, little molecule of oxygen. Usually when we talk about a molecule, we are combining a couple elements. So like if you had a water molecule, that would be two hydrogens and an oxygen. You put them all together and now you have a water molecule, a single water molecule. Um, so now this is done via chemical bonds. Um, hopefully you guys remember kind of chemical bonds. Uh, we are going to get into them a little bit, but that's what's represented right here, is these lines that are going from, say, carbon to hydrogen, that's a bond right there, right there and right there. So you have carbon bonded with four hydrogens. So carbon bonded with four hydrogens is represented as CH4, meaning one C and four H's. This guy is known as methane, right? Do you guys know what methane is? If you don't, it's the stuff that comes out of stinky cow's butts. It's farts. Okay, it's just a actually really stable molecule, but it's a byproduct of, you know, metabolism. And then that's something they release to get rid of in the form of methane, which is farts. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so again, the definition of a molecule would be any two or more elements chemically bonded together. Now, they can be the same element, so you can have two oxygen atoms bonded together, and that's still a molecule. Or you can have, like, two hydrogen and the oxygen, or four... Um, hydrogen and a carbon, that's all, again, those would be considered molecules. So this would be a stable methane molecule right here. Here's a water molecule. So we have our big O, which is our oxygen molecule, and then we have our two H's over here. The size is kind of representative on how actually they, they uh, how big they are. So oxygen is bigger than hydrogen, has more electrons, that's the kind of cloud that they're floating in. Now, oxygen is sharing electrons with hydrogen on both sides here. So it's chemically bonded right here in what's called a covalent bond. So inside the water molecule holding the oxygen to each of the hydrogens is a covalent bond. These bonds are really hard to break. They're really strong. So that water molecule is, again, super hard to break up. And that's what's going to give it a lot of its chemical properties in the future when we talk about that. <laughs> Um, is the fact that it's very, it's got these strong bonds and therefore it's going to take a lot of energy to try to break those bonds up. Now, even though oxygen is sharing electrons with each of the hydrogen molecules, oxygen is greedy. And oxygen's like, yeah, instead of like a 50-50 share, I'm actually going to take more of it. And therefore, electrons have a negative charge. 
protons are positive, neutrons are neutral, electrons are negative. Um, and so oxygen is sharing, or, you know, sharing that neutral charge, except oxygen is greedy, so oxygen is taking more. Which means if oxygen is taking more of a negative, it's going to be slightly negative, and that's what we see right here. Because he's supposed to, these guys are supposed to share equally, now hydrogen's like, hey, you have all my negative, which makes me less negative, which makes me a little bit positive. Okay, so again, oxygen is greedy, it's, it's hogging all the electrons. Electrons have a negative charge, therefore oxygen hogs the negative, becoming slightly negative. And each one of the hydrogens are like missing a little bit of their electrons, and therefore missing some negative, and therefore are positive. Okay, this is known as polarity meaning there's different charges on different ends of the molecule. This is really important because this polarity actually gives water like all of its properties. So remember we're talking about we have this covalent bond, these really strong bonds that makes it hard to break up? Well the polarity gives it all of these other properties. So again, really it's just because oxygen is a super greedy molecule and it hogs all the electrons, it makes this molecule polar and really, really unique. And so we're going to see some of the unique properties of being polar. Um, because really what happens is if you have a negative end on this side and a positive end on the other, these water molecules are going to be attracted to each other. That attraction of water molecules, again, is going to lead to some pretty cool stuff, which we're going to see in just a second. Okay. Um, let's talk about these attractions that these water molecules have. This is known as a hydrogen bond. Okay, so we have a negative end of the oxygen molecule right here. We have a positive end of the hydrogen molecule right here. This little dotted line represents a hydrogen bond, okay? Now the negative and the positives are attracted to each other, you know, just like negatives and positives do, um, like magnets, and they get stuck together. So now all these water molecules are sticking to each other. Not only are they sticking on the inside, remember on the inside of these water molecules is a covalent bond. Between water molecules is a hydrogen bond. Make sure you guys make that distinction because you will have some questions on that coming up. Wink, wink, hint, hint. Right? Okay. Um, so again, negative end of the uh, oxygen molecule is going to get attracted to the positive end of the hydrogen mo water molecule. And again, each of these water molecules has a negative end, a positive end. Technically, it has two positive ends. Right? So we have a positive end here and a positive end here. So these are going to want to be attracted to all sorts of different wa water molecules. They're just going to want to grab all of these water kills molecules and be like, let's all on. Okay? So this is what's what gives it what's called cohesive properties or cohesion, which means the stickiness of water. So water is going to stick to other water molecules. Um, do, 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 do. And again, it's all based on this hydrogen bonding, which is great. All right, say we have um, an ice cube. This is kind of represented here. It's not the best diagram. I don't particularly like this one, but eh, let's talk about it. Um, so you can see in here, all of these water molecules are attracted to, uh, you know, one another because of these hydrogen bonds. And what happens is you actually, the first thing that needs to happen to cause evaporation is you need to break up these bonds because they're all these water molecules are holding on to each other. So you can't have the whole block of ice or water, or whatever you're talking about, evaporate into the air because they're all still holding on. It's too heavy. So what first has to happen is you have to break these hydrogen bonds. Okay. That requires energy. Eventually, if you really are going to go to vapor, you have to start breaking up the covalent bonds inside the water molecule, and that's a whole different story, even harder to do. But that's what makes it so, you know, it takes so long for things like water to evaporate. There's a lot of breaking of these bonds that, that needs to happen, and that's usually all energy, most of the time in the form of heat. All right. Um, so we talked a little bit about cohesion or the cohesive properties. This means the stickiness of water. Those hydrogen bonds are sticking to each other because of the polarity of the water. Right? That water molecule being polar allows those hydrogen bonds to form, which allows them to be sticky, which allows all of these different things to happen. So we have uh, liquid water, which is kind of a good thing for us because, you know, our planet is pretty much the water planet. Um, and that's really unique of water because most molecules are only found in one state or maybe two states naturally. Water occurs in all three states naturally. That would be the solid, the liquid, and the gas. So again, solid would be ice, liquid would be water, and gas would be, you know, water vapor. Sm uh, not smoke, I almost said smoke. Like things, like things like fog and stuff like that. And really, just even right now, there's water vapor in the air. Especially if it's humid, if you live where it's humid, oh, there's a ton of water in the air. All right, 
so we have these three states, solid, liquid, and gas. Water actually occurs in all three states naturally, which is pretty cool. Now, what happens when it's in the gaseous state is these little molecules just kind of float around. They're really far away from each other, and they're just kind of floating, doing their little thing, just moving around. When they start getting into the liquid state, they actually become a little bit more compact, which is why liquid is denser than air, right? That kind of makes sense. Water vapor is never going to be heavier than actual water. Um, that's because these molecules are compressed into smaller space. This is, this is what it means to be dense, is more molecules in the same amount of space. Now, when you get to ice, when you get to the solid, it's actually kind of the reverse. So it almost goes from, you know, less dense to water to more dense. Now back to less dense when you're talking about ice. And that's because these molecules, when they freeze, they actually form this crystalline pattern, which you can see right here, and they kind of push away from each other. Because again, those positives don't want to be anywhere near the positives, and the negatives don't want to be near the negatives. They want to be with positives and negatives. So they kind of orient themselves, pushing away from other water molecules, you know, uh, if they're the wrong side. You know, obviously they're going to be attracted to the positive and the negative end, but if it's a positive and positive, they're going to push away. So that's why we get this kind of... Um, this kind of crystalline shape because water molecules have to force their way away from each other. Now this is great because it actually traps air inside of here, also not allowing the same amount of molecules to pack into that same space as say water, and that's why ice floats. But we're going to talk about that in just a second. Alright, so we're going from this crystalline shape right here. If we we're melting, so this would be ice. We have to add temperature, so we're adding temperature as we go up, 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 up. Eventually, we're going to hit this threshold where we're going to start getting liquid water as the ice melts, melt, 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 until we finally hit a threshold where, boom, we're actually going to start to get vapor gas. So this would be essentially if you were boiling an ice cube, what would happen? The three states of matter that it would go through and how much heat you would actually need to add to get that evaporation. So that's all that this uh, graph is showing right here. Um, okay, so let's talk about ice again for a second. Remember that ice is less dense than water, which is why ice floats. This is great for things like polar bears because they get a place to live. It's also great for the fish underneath because it was just freezing all year round and it was super cold and water froze from the bottom up. All those fish under there would freeze to death, right? But it freezes only on the top because it freezes from the top down. So it freezes only on the top and it actually creates a protective layer which protects all the animals who live underneath from those cold air temperatures, right? So ice is actually kind of like an insulator protecting all the little fishies underneath and therefore in the Arctic we don't just have a frozen block of ice, we just have a nice ice layer and then we have water underneath. So habitats for everybody, yay. Um, okay, do, 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 do. we learned about gas vapor, we already talked about that, it's just, you know, gas, it's when it evaporates, not methane gas, just water vapor gas. Um, obviously the process of going from a liquid to a gas is called evaporation. Hopefully you guys do know this. I'm going to be breezing, breezing through some of this because it, it's like common knowledge. You should know what evaporation is. But if you don't, this is where I'm going to stop and, you know, um, you know, clarify stuff like that. I don't know. Explain? What am I trying to say here? Um, bah, 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 bah. and again, water is the only substance that occurs in all three states of matter naturally. We can artificially kind of manipulate some of the other ones, but water is like the universal everything. It's just the best, which is why there's so much life on our planet. So you really have to thank everything to water. Thank you, water. I appreciate you. That's not even water, it's tea, but it's made with water. And that brings me to my next point. Water is an excellent solvent. Have you ever noticed that water dissolves anything? That's because water is polar. What? Yes, this polarity again. These water molecules surround anything in there and just kind of break up like tea. I think that might be my next slide. If not, I'm going to get there. Ah, I get ahead of myself. All right, let's go back to density for a second. Remember, density is just how many things you have in a space or mass per volume. Also, a fancy way of putting it. Okay, so at lower temperatures, usually the water molecules are kind of, kind of condensing a little bit. You can think of when making tea. Right? You don't make tea with cold water. That takes a long time. You make it with hot water. And that's because, you know, in hot water, things are moving really rapidly and really moving fast and kind of far away from each other. But when things get cold, they kind of get dense and they get more solid. That's why they're moving into that crystalline shape that we talked about a couple slides ago. Um, so you see the solid right here is very, very dense. 
the liquid is less dense, right? Molecules are more free to move around. And then the gases, finally, those molecules are just floating around like crazy. Now, we're not talking about ice here. We're just talking about a solid. So this is a little bit different. Um, I don't want to confuse you guys too much, so we're not going to get too much more into that one. But you should know that density is mass over volume, or how big something is over how much space it takes up. Okay, so how much is there versus how much space is there. So if I have a lot of water molecules in a small amount of space, that would be very dense. If I don't have a lot of water molecules in the same amount of space, that would be less dense, right? It wouldn't have the same density. Um, okay. Now I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, now I'm catching up to myself. When we talk about how cold water sinks and warm water floats until you hit ice and then ice shoots to the top. So warmer water, again, is going to have those molecules that are moving a little bit farther away from each other, a little bit more spread out. Colder water is going to be the more dense molecules that are kind of like trapped together. But then ice, again, they finally freeze, but then go boop, and you know, that's when the ice floats because it actually is way less than um, water, which is what you can see right here. Um, yeah, we talked about all this, densities. Okay. So, moving on to the next property that water has. Water has a lot of amazing properties. One, the fact that ice floats is super cool. And again, this is all based, all these properties are based on the polarity. Oxygen is a greedy little molecule, oh, sorry, a greedy little element, and it hogs the electrons, which creates a polarity. That polarity allows for hydrogen bonds to form between the water molecules, which makes them sticky. That's why ice floats. That's why it also has a high, what's called latent heat of melting. Essentially, this just means it takes a lot of energy to change water from one state to the other. And if you've ever watched water boil, you know what I'm talking about. You put it on and you crank up the fire and you're like, oh, it's gonna burn soon. And then you're like, it's like 10 minutes later and still nothing's happened. You're adding a ton of heat to that water and nothing's happening. Water's like, I can absorb all this heat and nothing's gonna change. Until a point, and then of course the, the temperature will actually start going up. And that's because you gotta break up those hydrogen bonds first. So those hydrogen bonds are like kind of resistant of the temperature change. They're kind of absorbing all of that, that energy. And then finally it's like, ah, fine, we break. And that's when those molecules are free to do that evaporation that we saw in that first picture, that diagram. Where once you break the hydrogen bonds, then they're free to actually enter into that gaseous state. Um, we do thank you water, have the highest temperature when it comes to the latent heat of melting. Um, so it's basically that water resists temperature change like no other, like nothing else on the planet. This also keeps our planet nice and, you know, normal. So water is absorbing heat in the summertime, which means that it's not as hot as it could be, even though it's hot, it's not as hot as it could be. And water is releasing that heat in the wintertime which is why it's not as cold as it could be. If we didn't have our oceans and the lakes and stuff like that, our temperature fluctuations could be all over the place, but water actually keeps us a nice, mellow temperature. That's why if you go out here to California, it's never, you know, freezing at the beach. It's also usually never scorching at the beach either. Like even on 110 day here in, you know, the valley or the desert-ish, and then you go out to the beach and you're like, man, it's only like 70 out here. Yeah, thank you water and the latent heat of melting. Um, well, latent heat of melting and heat capacity, I kind of use interchangeably. They're not, they are two separate things. This is the heat where it's actually being absorbed by the water, maintaining that steady heat. The latent heat of melting is basically the same thing, but when it comes from ice to water. This is kind of just like water to evaporation, so it's just the next step. That's why I kind of talk about them as the same thing, because it really is conceptually the same. Don't let those chemists argue because this is not chemistry. But they can explain it way better than I. This is just the overview of what I need you guys to know. So this is what I was talking about. Not only does it have the highest latent heat of melting, it also has the highest heat capacity, which means you can crank up that temperature on the water and it's gonna take forever before the temperature actually changes. Again, solid to a liquid, liquid to a gas. It's all kind of the same thing. Basically, water is amazing. So make sure you guys do know these and can at least get the gist of what we're talking about by each one of these. I mean, it could be an essay question because we're spending a whole lecture on water. Actually, two lectures on water. Oh my God, so much water. So make sure that you guys do know these properties of water and why Because of oxygen. Greedy molecule. All right, moving on. Um, again, also great, not only for keeping our planet nice and cool, but 
how many marine organisms and, and freshwater organisms rely on the water? If the water wasn't able to absorb heat, we would go through these fluctuations in a day and these animals would just die. They're like, oh my God, I just can't take it. It's just too hot. Not to mention the freezing temperatures up in the, you know, the poles, up and down in the poles, um, where if it froze from the bottom up, everything would die. But if it freezes from the top down, we actually get this nice little protective layer and not everything dies, which is good. Um, okay. Oh, one thing though, if you do live in a shallow body of water, obviously there's less water, which means there is going to be a greater temperature fluctuation because it's not going to be able to moderate as much because there's just less water. So it, in those instances, you have to be resilient to temperature. Things like tide pools, small little ponds, on a hot day can get 100 degrees, on a cold day can get, you know, wherever, it depends on where you live, can get cold. So now you're going through a 40 or 50 degree temperature variation in a single day. A lot of organisms can't handle that. And we can only handle that because we have things like air conditioners and jackets, right? This poor little fish doesn't have a jacket. Okay. All right, moving on. Uh, latent heat of evaporation, you can kind of guess what this is. Same thing with the latent heat of melting. Water has the absolute highest. We're going from that one transitional state to the next, one transitional state to the next, from the solid to the liquid to the gas. It basically just means how much heat you can add to this before you change states. So it's kind of repetitive, um, I do know, but be, just be able to understand kind of why all these things are happening because of, of water. So, um, yeah, highest water, again, highest everything. Water's just the best. All right, so those are all the properties of water. We talked about how it has cohesive properties, right? It sticks to one another, has the highest uh, latent heat of melting, the highest uh, heat capacity, the highest um, latent heat of evaporation, right? It's basically the highest everything. Water is just amazing. But now let's talk a little bit about specifically seawater, not just water water. We're gonna be talking about water with things in it. So I'm not talking about living things, I'm talking about like salts and minerals and stuff like that. And that is known as salinity. So water plus dissolved, what's called solutes, um, is considered salinity. So if you have, let's talk about my tea again. If you have a tea bag and you're trying to melt it into water, the solute is the tea. The solvent, so the solute, the thing that is doing the dissolving is the tea. The solvent, the things that is doing the dissolving, that is repetitive, the thing that it dissolves in, hang on. <laughs> All right, solute, the thing that is being dissolved. The solvent, the thing that is doing the dissolving. There, that's a better way to put it. Okay, so the solute gets dissolved inside the solvent. The water in my tea is the solvent. The tea is the solute. Okay, so in this case, if we're talking about salt, meaning salt water, the salt is the solute, and the water is the solvent. You can remember this is the water is always the universal solvent. Water is always the thing being dissolved, doing the dissolving. <laughs> Sorry, water is always the thing doing the dissolving. Okay, so if you were to put, you know, that ground coffee into your water, still water is the solvent. If you were to put tea into the water, still water is the solvent. If you were to put salt inside the water, still water is the solvent. Sugar, whatever, all of those things are solutes inside what you're actually trying to dissolve into is the solvent. I know. I can barely say it correctly, so do make sure you remember it. These are not easy words because they're very, very similar to one another and the definitions are just minute. So make sure to pay attention to the difference between the solvent and the solute. When dealing with ocean water, we're talking about salinity, but that salinity does vary depending on where you are. Um, especially if you have things like freshwater influxes, say you have a river or a stream that lets out right at the ocean, the ocean right there, that's going to fluctuate. Um, so what you usually do is we measure that salinity in all the different parts of the ocean and that is called, well, you're basically just measuring salinity, but it's done in parts per thousand. So PPT. So typically we have a thousand grams of water in a thousand grams of water. We have 35 grams of salt. This is about 3.5% salt or 35 parts per thousand. So 35 parts per thousand grams is what we're talking about, 35 in a thousand. So you're gonna hear this a couple different ways, either 3.5% salinity or 35 parts per thousand. Okay, so make sure that you know both of those numbers because both of them are correct. 
you just it depends on which one you're actually using so that is salinity and that's again talking about the dissolved solutes in the solvent or the water all right so imagine we have a salt cube and we've chucked it in the water so here's our beaker we have our little salt cube right here that salt cube is made of sodium chloride sodium na and chlorine cl these are the just short names for these elements so sodium ions have a slightly positive charge chlorine ion ions have a slightly negative charge what else has a slightly negative end and a slightly positive oh water so again the polarity of water is going to allow this salt cube to break up really easily because these are polar molecules meaning they have a positive charge or a negative charge okay so the polar water molecule will turn and face chlorine or sodium depending on which you know side it wants to be attracted to positive to negative etc okay so this water molecule you'll see them actually turns and surrounds it so in this case we have the negative water molecule of the chlorine being surrounded by the positive end of the water molecule those those H plus um, ends and on the chlorine side sorry the sodium side here we have a positive end being surrounded by the negative end of the oxygen so these water molecules will just turn and orient themselves and kind of back up into these little ions and therefore break up their hydrogen bonds because if their hydrogen bonds are needed then they're like well, I can form a hydrogen bond with chlorine, or I can form a hydrogen bond with this water molecule. I don't need to form it with sodium anymore. So then they don't, and they really form ionic bonds, and that's kind of what they're doing here. So they're not really forming hydrogen bonds. They're forming ionic bonds, and that's a bond between two ions. And that's, again, anything an ion is anything with a charge. So sodium ion, chlorine ion, those are both have charges. Um, the water molecule is polar, so it does have a charge. It's not considered an ion, but they do form ionic bonds. That's all you need to know about that. I know that was a bit much. You're like, what are you talking about? Ionic bonds? Don't worry about it so much. All right. So here are some um, common elements that we find in a sample of seawater. I wish we were actually doing this in class so I could show you the sample of seawater and, you know, break all this stuff down. But that's okay. We're going to do it virtually. So you can see the bulk of it is going to be chlorine and sodium. That's, again, just table salt. Chlorine and sodium together make sodium chloride. That's just regular salt. And then we have trace amounts of kind of all of these other things. So it's not just um, salt water. There are other things in it, but majority of it is salt. Now, we did talk about how it is, on average, 35 parts per thousand, you know, salinity in the ocean. But that's not everywhere. We did talk about how if you have river runoffs, you're going to have a lower salinity because you're going to have more fresh water, less salt water or salinity water. Okay, but in some parts, you actually have the opposite. You have more evaporation, meaning your water is leaving, your fresh water is leaving, and now you're really, really salty. Okay, so you can see things like here in the Mediterranean, they don't have a ton of fresh water influxing, and therefore, whatever salt is there kind of remains there, but the water will eventually evaporate away. So the salt stays, the water goes, and now you have super, super salty water. And I was in Italy last year, and it was super salty. That's things like the Dead Sea in there where you can just like float on nothing because, you know, there's so much salinity. Uh, and then if you were to look, say, way out here, right near the Arctic or the Antarctic, right, they actually have a ton of water because they have all that snowfall, they have the melting of the ice caps, especially now. They're, so they're going to have extra fresh water, which means their salinity is going to be very low. So they're getting more fresh water and they're having less salt. So on average, yes, it is 35 parts per thousand, but it does change. Sometimes it goes up over 37, sometimes it goes down under 34. Actually, in estuaries and stuff like that, we're going to talk about them, they get down to like zero because it's all fresh water coming in and then it meets and maybe it's like 5 to 15, you know, maybe 20. It's still really low, but then on the ocean side, it's back to normal at like 35. So we're going to talk all about estuaries at the end of the semester. All right, so this should not shock you that you can see through water. What? I know. Water is relatively transparent not all water we actually have a bunch of stuff floating around in our water and no it's not all pollution most of it in fact is phytoplankton which is really good for our ecosystem it means we have a nice healthy balanced ecosystem if you were to look in the tropics they have no phytoplankton uh, and that's why their waters are so clear it's not that they're cleaner than ours it's just they're full of less stuff yeah, it's not a bad thing or a good thing depends on you but if you have a darker waters like ours, you can't see as far through them, which means light is not going to penetrate as far down. 
Now this might not affect you, but it would affect some other organisms, especially if you're photosynthetic. If you're photosynthetic and you live on the bottom of the ocean, you need that sunlight, right? If you're gonna live in the cloudy waters that we have out here, you probably can't live very deep because the not enough light is gonna get to you. Alternatively on the tropics, if you live in the tropics and you do photosynthesis, you're like, oh, I'm totally good. The water's crystal clear. I can live a lot deeper. Okay, so it really just depends on water clarity. Um, what can affect water clarity is things like freshwater influxes. So you're thinking, well, it's fresh water. It's pretty clear, right? Yeah, but it usually picks up some sediment along the way. If you've ever seen a river and kind of lets go into the ocean, usually there's a bunch of sediment going along with it. So that can affect water clarity for sure. Um, it also would bring things like minerals, maybe nutrients with it. So that can all have all sorts of different effects on the ecosystem. And we're going to talk about different ecosystem fluctuations coming up in the next couple lectures. Uh, if you were ever to look at the Mississippi, the muddy Mississippi, yeah, it is muddy. So if you were living near the ocean and you were photosynthetic and you lived at the mouth of the Mississippi River, you probably would not do very well, which means you probably would not survive, which means you probably wouldn't be found there. So again, it affects the community compositions, what the ecosystem is like. Um, let's see, we talked about that. Oh, solutes come from all sorts of places like river runoff, melting of the polar ice caps, um, yeah, weathering of rocks, you know, erosion happens all the time, especially out here in California, Malibu is just falling into, the, falling into the ocean. You know, that adds a certain level of nutrients every time those rocks fall in, um, all sorts of stuff. Uh, we get things like volcanic eruptions, which we just had in Hawaii. So that's where we added things like sulfides and chlorines and other, these minerals and stuff that are just spewed out from the volcano into the air, which eventually will go into the ocean. We have things like sodium, potassium, magnesium, which are coming off of river runoffs. And finally, again, we have underwater hydrothermal vents, which are spewing out sulfur and, and stuff like that and chlorines and all sorts of weird things. Not weird, just not things that we need, but things that we eat need. So it's all this definite balance and this recycling of nutrients and minerals and elements and, it, and energy. It's all sorts of crazy, but we're going to talk about energy cycling coming up. All right, so getting back to seawater and what is in our seawater. So now we've learned about certain elements that are in our seawater. We've learned that the majority of it is, not the majority of it is salt, but a good percentage of the solutes in salt water oh, are salt. Uh, but there's also other gases and stuff like that. And that's also crucial for other organisms. So we are not the other only organisms that breathe oxygen. I hate to break it to you. Almost everything needs, almost everything needs oxygen to survive. And therefore, especially the animals, you're doing cellular respiration, you need oxygen. Cellular respiration is how you get energy and how you get cellular energy and you need oxygen for that. So these organisms like fish and sharks and barnacles and crabs and mollusks and stuff, they still need oxygen. And they're getting that from the dissolved oxygen in the ocean. Not everything needs oxygen. Plants need CO2, they're getting that carbon Right? Also from that dissolved, um, those dissolved gases. So things like um, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen gas, all of these things are needed from, for certain organisms and they can be found in the air. So when they're found in the air, eventually they will diffuse, like we learned about diffusion, they will diffuse into the water. Okay, that's how we get things like dissolved gases. So you can imagine at the top of the water, you're going to have the most dissolved gases. At the bottom of the water, you're going to have the least amount of dissolved gases. Um, also because things are, you know, breathing them in. All right, so here's where sometimes the gases in the air can be really, really bad for the things in the water. Um, you guys have heard of CO2 emissions. It's kind of a big problem. You know, cars are pumping it out. We are pumping it out. Our cattle and livestock are pumping it out. We're cutting down the things that suck it up, like trees. So our CO2 emissions are kind of a big deal right now, and here's why. So we have atmospheric CO2, normally not that high concentration, but in any concentration, what happens is it essentially gets dissolved into the ocean. It gets dissolved again, usually used via cellular respiration or photosynthesis and then recycled out, right? So the dissolved CO2 would get sucked up by the plants or the algaes in photosynthesis. They would turn it into oxygen because that's their byproduct. It would get sucked up via cellular respiration or just respiration via animals and then it would be spewed out as CO2. That's just a normal, healthy, gaseous cycle. That's okay. However, sometimes we have too much CO2 and what happens is it actually mixes with water and becomes carbonic acid. Okay, so increasing the amount of CO2 in the air actually increases the amount of acid in the water. 
And this is what's called causing ocean acidification. Right? Hopefully you guys have heard of that term, ocean acidification, because it is absolutely happening because of these CO2 gases that are of too, too high abundances in the air. It's getting dissolved into the water and it's causing this carbonic acid, which is not a good thing. Uh, sometimes it's also mixing with the sediments, and this is, can be a good thing. I mean, a lot of these organisms need things like um, carbonate and stuff like that. And these are definitely, these are just molecules and they're usually used for structure protection, like in shells. However, if there's too much CO2, the acid in the water actually helps to dissolve these shells. So the very thing that was supposed to be making their shells hard is essentially turning into carbonic acid and making their shells weak. Vicious cycle. And that's what they use for protection. So if they can't protect themselves, then they're going to die off. We're going to lose things like crabs and clams and lobsters and shrimp and oysters and it's bad. I love those things. All right. So we talked about how oxygen gets recycled, carb uh, carbon dioxide gets recycled. This is basically just the mutualistic relationship between photosynthetic organisms and animals, really. So the photosynthetic organisms suck up the CO2 and they expel O2. We suck up O2 and expel CO2. It's this mutualistic relationship. But until it's one-sided, that's when things really get to be a problem. So now we're pumping out way too much CO2 and the algaes aren't, you know, plants and algaes aren't able to actually suck it up enough and therefore there's just this high increase of CO2, which like we talked about is a bad thing. So you can imagine all of these different things, most of them are animals, most of them are going to be expelling CO2, not sucking it up, and therefore the scales are being tipped one way instead of being this nice mutualistic relationship. Okay, now we talked about how salinity can vary where you are on the planet. Well, temperatures and other things can vary as well. So conditions are not uniform throughout the ocean. If you've ever been in the ocean, usually if you go to the beach and you're, you know, right on the top, it's not super cold, but if you've ever been way far out, it's way colder out there. And that's because usually the heat is coming from the sun, which heats up the bottom, which warms up the water. If the bottom is very, 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 very far away, that water is not seeing, sorry, the bottom is not seeing any sun, which means nothing's going to get reflected back and heated up. So essentially a lot of that heat is getting lost and therefore not, you know, and not to mention, we learned about how much heat it takes to heat up water. A ton. Okay. Um, so not only does temperature vary, but also things like pressure. If you've ever gone diving down to the bottom of your pool and you're like, yeah, that kind of hurts. Yeah, you need to equalize because there's gases in your brain and your body and everything else like that that need to equalize because the pressure increases and that's when you feel that <laughs> pressure, literally. Um, so that's, again, these vary by depth. So temperature... Uh, dissolved oxygen, dissolved gases, um, even salinities can vary, which we're going to see in just a second. So lots of these things can vary depending on depth or how deep in the ocean you go. So let's look at temperature real quick. So this graph basically shows the increase in water depth and temperature rising. So you can see when it's shallow, the temperature is actually pretty high. But then you're going to drop and eventually you hit this drastic drop off. This is known as a thermocline. A decline is just kind of a drastic change. A thermocline would be a drastic change in temperature, hence thermo. So this is where it goes from relatively warm and then kind of like a nice gradual scale. All of a sudden, like, it just drops. And that's what you can see right here. The steep, steep drop. That's a thermocline. So this layer right here, that would be the thermocline or the threshold before it starts to change really, really rapidly. Um, if we're looking at salinity, this is known as a halocline. And yes, you do need to know all these. So this is our halocline right here. So salinity is actually pretty low at the top, but increases as you go. It actually has several different halocline's. So in this case, we have two halocline's depending on how deep you go, and that's increasing the salinity. And that kind of makes sense if you think about it, because salinity is dissolved solvent, or is it, sorry, dissolved solute. See, I'm getting ahead of myself. It's dissolved solute. If you have a lot more dissolved stuff in your water, it's going to be heavier, which means it's going to sit down here. Right? So as you increase salinity, you increase the stuff in the water, it gets heavier. Not to mention all these little things floating in the water are eventually going to settle to the bottom, and that's where they get stuck there. Uh, water density, same thing with temperature, uh, sorry, same thing with salinity. It increases as you go down, right? And we learned that warmer temperatures, warmer temperatures have less density, colder temperatures have more density. Okay, and that's again just something that we learned early on. Hopefully you guys remember that. Now, 
the way we measure this is actually pretty cool. We basically take a bottle with a thermometer on the inside and we send it down to the bottom of the ocean. And what you can see right here is every few feet it's going to be taking, or every few meters I should say, it's going to be taking a reading. And you can see here it's all the same, the same, the same. Oh, there's a drop, there's a drop, there's a drop, there's a drop. Boom! And then it's going to hit basically the same temperature from 1,000 meters to 3,000 meters. And that's because there's no light there, which means there's nothing to heat up, which means it's going to stay nice and cold. In fact, the average temperature of the ocean is 3 degrees Celsius. That's practically freezing, right? So if you go down to the very, very depths of the ocean, it is cold, 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 because there's no sunlight. Anyway, and this drastic change right here from regular to boo, that is the thermophile drastic change in temperature. Um, this shouldn't shock you guys. I'm sure you've seen a picture like this uh, at some point in your lives. This is basically just the heat index in the world's ocean. So up by the poles and down by the poles, it's cold, right? But along the equator, it's really hot. And in fact, in some places in the world, it is really hot, really, 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 really hot. And that's because there's shallow waters right there. And th that is the tropics. So if you think about you know, the Great Barrier Reef, Fiji, Indonesia, all those crazy places, that's all right in here. And those are very shallow waters, which means there's not a lot of water to absorb all that heat. So now the sunlight is just beating down on the, on the you know, seafloor, and that's warming up the water. The water's like, dude, I can only take so much temperature before I change because I don't have a lot, I'm not a big volume. If you look way out here in the Pacific, right in the middle of the Pacific, there's a ton of water volume. Which means even along the equator, it's never going to get that hot because there's so much depth to the water, it's going to absorb all of that heat. Same thing basically we're seeing right here, except in a slightly different um, diagram. And with that, I will end our part one on water, on seawater. Remember, there is part two, and yes, I do like to give you terrible little jokes. In this case, I gave you guys two. I was cool before it was water. Wait. I was water before it got cool. Got dyslexia today. And the other one, what's the matter? I'm a solid, but I'm becoming liquid. Oh. Anyway, get it, matter, three states of matter. Okay, terrible, I'm out of here. Before I keep talking nonsense, you guys, thank you so much for sticking with me, I appreciate it. Make sure to double check any quiz dates, homework dates, discussion dates, anything like that on the Canvas site. And I will see you guys um, for Seawater Part Two shortly.